All right, guys. Thank you guys for joining me. We are going to be in Mark chapter 2 today. I hope everybody out there is having a wonderful, wonderful day. If not, man, my hair looks crazy. I look crazy. Anyways, let's get into this, guys. Father God, I want to come before you today, Lord, and I just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for waking me up, Lord. Thank you for everything in my life, Lord. Just, yeah, thank you so much for everything I, I walked away from you for so long lord and you're so faithful and you're so you're so devout and you're so personal and you're just so steady lord thank you for always being that thing that we can count on that thing that's for sure the only certainty in this world lord that's what you are for us help us to take comfort in that help us to walk in that truth help us to walk in the victory lord because we have it there's no reason for us as Christians to ever walk around with an attitude or an air of defeat around us because by our very nature we are victorious because we belong to the victor. Thank you, Lord. Pray for you to bless this word today, Lord, this video that anybody watching it at any time may, may desire to be more from watching it, Lord, all by way of you. Let us be your faithful Humble servants, bless us to be that city on a hill, that light that cannot be hidden. Lord, in your heavenly name we pray. Amen. God is good. Somebody out there, finish that say amen. Let's get into this, guys. We're going to be in Mark 2 today. All right. And again, he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Sons, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Then he went out again by sea, by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. I hate to stop like this in the middle, but I want to point something out. I don't think I remember to write it down. But anyways, guys, Levi is Matthew. It's another name for Matthew. Book of Matthew's Matthew. That Matthew. So when we see Levi, that's Matthew. Sorry, didn't mean to stop. Mark 2, chapter... Mark 2, verse 15. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. 
No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Amen, guys. There's some really interesting stuff here. Hope you guys are. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this, man. I really get. I really enjoy getting to do this every day, guys. I'll be honest with you. I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes it's a lot of work. You know, it's like a. It's like waking up every day to write a three or four hour book report. But I do it after I get done with work in the morning. So, but it's just so awesome. Like I really love it. And I hope you guys enjoy it. So, let's get into this, man. Mark 2, verses 1 through 12. So, I'm not going to reread all of that, but that's basically the story of the paralytic. So, um, let's talk about getting friends to the cross. Helping people up by showing them where to kneel. What a picture of how lost and hopeless we can be when we are lost in our sin. We've got a guy here who can't grant himself any reprieve from this handicap. He wasn't going to make it to Jesus without some help. Though alive, he was powerless. Occurrences like this are just one of many reasons that having godly friends is not just beneficial, but truly a necessity in our walk of faith. This story's four friends paints a great picture of how to act as Christians in our efforts to encourage those not yet aware of Christ or perhaps not all that he has to offer us. Not one of us can ever offer salvation to another, but we can certainly introduce them to the Savior. Though we cannot free them from the shackles of sin itself, we know just who to point them to for them to be washed as white as driven snow, guys. We know the way. We, the elect, can bring those around to Jesus in three ways. Okay, guys, I want to share those with you right now. Okay? Okay. Because, man, let me tell you right now, if it hadn't been out for people out there doing some of this stuff for me, I know I would not be here today. It's basically Jesus and Mama and everybody else out there that was kind enough to pray for me and to maybe even just hope for me, man. And so let's talk about these guys before I get into a bunch more stuff. So there's three ways that we can help lead people around us to Jesus. By intercession, this is prayer, from a tender-hearted care and the act of crying out to our loving Creator to make a way for the lost to be found and to glory in all that we are made by our Savior's love. By intercession, guys, by praying, man, by getting down on your knees and just saying, look, God, I don't know what needs to happen in this person's life, but, but whatever it is that needs to happen, for them to make their way to the foot of the cross. Lord, make that happen. Lord, make that happen for them. And it does. It does, guys. There's such power in prayer. Just as our words can have negative impact, so too can they have amazing positive impact when we say the right words to the right people. Number two, guys, the second way that we can lead people, our friends, to Jesus is in conversation. We lead our friends to Christ when we speak on our faith. Just being a generally helpful friend, one who's always eager to answer any questions they might have, secular, non-secular, whatever, just to be there. We are each called to be devoted, faithful, loving, eager servants to our Lord and Savior, walking our daily Christian walk, pushing ourselves into a brighter and brighter stance as an as a ever-present city on a hill, as that thing that can't be ignored, guys. The third one... The third way that we can get people we care about, our friends and, and family, to Jesus is by invitation, man. RSVP, right? 
the most real and practical way that we can help those around us come to Christ is perhaps by literally picking them up for church and maybe invite them out for a meal before or after and use that chance to, to discuss the faith, to foster the faith, to nurture it, to, to see what maybe what things they would like to know or what things they, they maybe don't understand or just anything, man. Eager to bring them to God, eager to bring them to church, setting with them at church, making them feel included, perhaps introducing them to friendly, like-minded believers, creating an atmosphere of friendly, caring acceptance. And when we introduce them to all of this, we are already introducing them not only to the works of God, but also to the very character of God himself, and that's what matters, guys. 2 verses 9 through 12, I'm going to read these three, let's get into this one. Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Here Jesus' argument shifts from the unseen to the seen. There is a spiritual realm which we cannot observe. And this is where the forgiveness of sins takes place, so we can't physically see it. And, and being that we are who we are, that's never good enough. So now, not only healing a paralytic, but doing so immediately, and then having him carry his own bed away, now that said something. That carried weight. That was something people could see. Obviously, no one... Obviously, no one can just heal paralysis with a word. Just like, obviously, no one can just wipe away all of our sins with a word. Well, I mean, you know, unless, of course, that person is God or is on a mission from God. In which case, he can. Now, also, as a note on verse 12, let me read that one more time. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. So as a note on verse 12, the people glorifying God. This is awesome, because their actions are clear, indicative proof that they recognize the divine authority of Jesus Christ. Belief is a choice, and while the scribes remain stiff-necked and refuse to accept what they've seen, the crowd was not so. And while both the scribes and the crowd saw the exact same thing, what the crowd did with it was they chose they chose to believe. Oh, and there's power in that, guys. There is power in that. 2, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> I hope you guys are enjoying this. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When we fall ill, most generally, we are aware of the fact that we are sick. Usually painfully aware of the fact that we are sick. Now the spiritually sick are very different in this, as the, in that most often, those suffering from 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 spiritual rot, from decay of the spirit, they don't recognize that they are sick. Certainly in the case of those who are hyper-religious, they will exhibit sickness and refuse to acknowledge it. These people will most often fail to see this illness in themselves. Luke 19.10, let me share something with you. This is from Luke 19.10, okay? Luke 9, actually, I'm going to read you Luke 19, 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man, Jesus, talking about Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, guys? Come to save that which was lost. So, as we've seen, Luke 19.10 tells us that Christ came for those of us desperate for and deeply in need of a personal powerful relationship with God that we just weren't going to be able to get on our own. 2 verses 18 through 20. 
The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. It was fine for the Jews to fast if it fit the purpose of, the intended purpose of pushing one more deeply into God. Now, like clockwork, the Pharisees were ritualistic in their fasting. Not from their hearts. It didn't come from the hearts. They continued to remain blind to the very fact that God cannot and will not be manipulated. Okay? Now, on verse 19, and Jesus announcing that there was no need for fasting because Jesus was already with them, this was meaning quite literally that God was already with them. God was in their midst, in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. Last one I'm going to share with you guys today, 2, verse 25. But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? So, have you never read? Questioning their knowledge with a hint of ironic criticism. Jesus doesn't justify himself by pushing scripture aside. Instead, he, he, he verifies himself by showing his familiarity and in-depth knowledge of not only the scripture, but its proper application in real-life situations. David was on a divine mission as the Lord's anointed. Okay? And yes... David ate the priest consecrated bread in order to be fortified enough in his spirit and his physicality to carry on in his mission. Jesus, son of David, final anointed one, allows his disciples to fulfill their physical needs so they can carry on with their mission of redemption. Not just a mission, but an absolute work of necessity that is always lawful, man. The work of redemption, y'all, against such there is... No law in the work of redemption and salvation, man. That's why we need everybody at the foot of the cross that we can get there, guys. If you're not subscribed, please smash the subscribe button. I drop a new video like this every single day of the week. If you have any comments, any prayer requests, anything at all, please feel free to put those down into the comment section. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Man, I love you guys. God loves you even more. I'm going to see you all tomorrow.